Shades of Benga Online presents highlights from the story of Kenya's popular music in the 70-year period between the end of the Second World War and 2016. The series draws its inspiration from the definitive book Shades of Benga by Ketebul Music. Greetings, my name is Lucy Ilado. I'm a music journalist based in Nairobi, Kenya. On the second episode of the Shades of Benga book series, we will be tackling the Congo connection and the social dance halls of Nairobi. On the panel from my left is Professor Larry Gumbe. Welcome once again. Holding a PhD degree from the Ohio State University in the US, he's a professional consulting engineer with the Engineers Board of Kenya after a long career as a professor in the engineering department at the University of Nairobi. He continues his academic work with the Technical University and Kenyatta University. Professor Gumbe has had keen interest in music since his childhood, is a lay music historian. Next, we have Mr. Tabo Susa, the lead author of the Shades of Benga book. Osusa has been a key part uh, of the Eastern African music industry for close to 40 years as a music producer, songwriter, promoter, and band manager. He's the founding executive director of Ketabu Music, a non-for-profit organization established in 2007. Mr. Osusa is the lead author of Shades of Benga, the story of popular music in Kenya, 1946 to 2016. He's also one of the five music rights champions at the International Music Council and one of the jury members at the All Africa Music Awards. Welcome, Mr. Osusa. And last but not least is Professor Bettina Ngueno. Welcome. Thank you. Bettina was born and grew up in Nairobi, Kenya. She now works as an associate professor in African American and African Studies at the University of California, Davis. She's currently writing a book about Nairobi that explores historic and present hopes and dreams of residents for their city in the face of urban planning that does not take them into account. Specifically, she looks at the planned development of old African railway houses estates where her father was born and grew up. She received her PhD in anthropology from Johns Hopkins University and a master's degree also in anthropology from Stanford University. To start us off, perhaps, Bettina, would you give us um, an overview of the role of music after World War II and uh, what role the dancing hall spaces played in the urban nights? Thank you very much, Lucy, for that. Mm -hmm. um, so after, after the Second World War, there was um, a big influence on music, as was said in the big first program, coming from soldiers in particular who had returned from the war. And they brought with them Western instruments and uh, great training in music. At the same time, the British government around the world was interested in how do you demobilize soldiers? So people mm -hmm. have been trained to fight, what do you do with them after a war? And so they instituted in most of housing, uh, residential housing, uh, a system of social halls. Mm -hmm. And these social halls were supposed to be able to provide leisure as well as uh, sports, mm -hmm. in particular boxing, um, as a sport that uh, uh, demilitarized soldiers could, could partake in. And one of the most famous of those spaces was Pumwani Social Hall. Uh, still known today for boxing as well as other ones like Mathura. People across Nairobi were dancing they were dancing to live music bands. Um, it didn't matter the sort of race of anyone, everybody was dancing, but they weren't dancing in the same places. Mm -hmm. Nairobi was a segregated city at this time under the colonial government, and so you couldn't go to, if you were African, you couldn't go to someone who's European or Asian. So there were separate spaces where everybody was dancing. And the main spaces that Africans had to dance were in the social hall. The music scene that time really changed with the arrival of two Congolese. One, Mwenda Ja Bosco, and uh, they say his cousin, Edward mm -hmm. Masengo. Masengo. Music from uh, World War II was more rumbaish and slow. But the, uh, Masengo and Bosco came with a very fast-paced sort of uh, finger-picking guitar style, mm -hmm. really changed everything, yeah. mm -hmm. and it really made uh, uh, the music scene, uh, like there was more dance to it, it was, you know, something really like, well, that's what, what really brought also uh, Kenyan musicians to, to change their style of play, mm -hmm. and that's why we had people like Ben Blastos of Bulawayo now coming on in the scene, and even the creation of uh, Omutibo, 
by George Mukabe. It was, it, it was greatly influenced by, um, uh, by Bosco and, and Masengo because of the, as I said earlier, the, the finger picking guitar style. But I just uh, want to go there, uh, jump into something that uh, many Kenyans think that rumba, like as, it is, as we know it, or rumba Congolese, came from Congo. No. The first influence from Congo mm -hmm. was actually by these two gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Earlier on, when uh, well, Fundi Konde was doing rumba, when he came from World War II, it was the same time the person we call the father of Congolese music is called Wendo Kolosoi. So Wendo Kolosoi was even one year younger than, uh, yeah. than Fundi Konde. Fundi Konde was born in 1924, and Wendo was born in 1925, and Boane was born in 1926. 26, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you see, and uh, they were all doing uh, something around the same time. They were basically, uh, I mean, uh, developing their rumba in Congo as we were developing ours here. Because mm -hmm. uh, Fundi Kondi's first recording was in 1944, which he did in India. And uh, mm -hmm. the, well, the, no, the known recording by, uh, or the most famous re recording by Wendo, uh, Papa Wendo was in 1948. Mm -hmm. So you see, we, we were just around the same time. I probably were ahead you know, of, of them anyway. But this, these two gentlemen really brought a radical change. This is the, Congo, uh, the, the Congolese connection. And yeah. uh, they came and only settled in, in Nairobi? Or yeah, they, did they, they uh, move to other parts of, of the country and the region that's East Africa? Actually, they moved around quite a bit. Huh? On the morning when I was born, there was a big concert. <laughs> I was born in Kisumu, <laughs> played by Edward Masengo. <laughs> And my mother was very disappointed that she couldn't attend. <laughs> because Masengo was playing. And the, some of the older people still call me Masengo up to now. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, that's, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, so they, they went around. And, and there is something else which also spurred the music when they came around. Because the commercial uh, potential mm -hmm. of music in terms of selling goods was mm -hmm. discovered at this time. Especially Edward Masengo. Masengo, I, I think Masengo stayed here much longer. And in the yeah, early that, 60s, that was he, was, he was marketing Coca-Cola, yeah, yeah, yeah. marketing yeah. something okay. else. Mm. If, if they were not marketing peace because of Mau Mau. Yes. But they, soap. They, yeah, they were, soap. Uh, they they marked uh, Aspro, yes, yes. Um, medicine. So there was, it came like that. But then, you see, Edward Masengo and uh, Jean Mwenda Bosco Abayeke mm. had a lot of influence because they were actually here. People access them physically. So the rumba music, as Tabu has rightly said, eh, we had our own rumba developing yes. in the coast of, of Kenya and in the hinterland of Kenya, and it was also developing in Congo. Uh, so we, we, it is not like we, we borrowed it. But the influence of these musicians who came here from Eastern Congo was fundamental. Because their language was also accessible to us. And I think also the advertising was incredibly important. They were used to advertise for the first time on a national level. So until that time, you know, people did not think of the African consumer as somebody of importance. To wrap up on the, on the, on the, on the two musicians from Congo, uh, how, how, when did they leave the country? And after they left, who are some of the musicians that emerged um, that took up the, the finger-picking style and, you know, continued with the sound? There's so many after. I think they were only here for about a year, actually. Okay. They, they, they didn't really stay in Kenya that long, but their impact was big. But as I said earlier on, that uh, after uh, Mwenda Jabusko left, people like Ben Blasters of Bulawayo took it. I mean, like the one who did the song, So Many Vijana. And then I said Mukabe also uh, mm -hmm. was greatly influenced. Mm -hmm. And then... That was also like the creation of the Benga music. So now let's listen to Nairobi City Ensemble performing So Many Vijana by Ben Blasters Bulawayo. Tulikuwa vijana Tulicheza na masomo Kazi ya watoto Kweli nila siku ni kucheza Tulikuwa vijana Tulicheza na masomo Kazi ya watoto Kweli kila siku ni kucheza So many vijana Muongeze pia bidi Mwisho wa kusoma Mutapata kazi nzuri sana So many vijana 
muongeze pia bidii mwisho wa kusoma tutapata kazi nzuri sana is an incredibly important moment for mm -hmm. Nairobi. Mm -hmm. Nairobi trebled in size. It went mm -hmm. from 100,000 people to mm -hmm. 300,000 people mm -hmm. by independence, mm -hmm. right? And it, one of the reasons was an expansion of the railways. Mm -hmm. But we have to think about 1950s interestingly because mm -hmm. it was a moment of the emergency. And that meant certain people could not be in Nairobi. And this yeah. is mainly the area of Central Province mm -hmm. and Mount Kenya area. So there was a limit of those people and a huge decrease in the number of those people mm -hmm. and an expansion of the railways and an expansion of the civil service. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, you find that there's a great influence of Nairobi in the 1950s from three different regions of the country that come in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Earlier, they were different, like coastal influences and other things. But those three regions are Nyanza, Western, and Ukambani. And that also affected all the music of Nairobi mm -hmm. because for about 10 years, those were the dominant outside influences that then were also borrowing from international sounds, Cuban, uh, Caribbean generally, mm -hmm. including uh, Calypso's, mm -hmm. um, the twist, and of course, um, the Congolese sound. Mm -hmm. And so those were the, yeah. South and, and the Kuela. South African mm -hmm. Kwela mm -hmm. in particular, which is a, also a version of that twist. That was yeah, our yeah. version of the twist. Twisty mm -hmm. comes from the Kwela, uh, the twist through South Africa. Uh -huh. And then mm -hmm. in 1959, which is a really important other issue of the railways, there was the biggest railway strike ever that was across East Africa. Mm -hmm. And this strike meant that um, one million people didn't travel. In one year, 
It was a reduction of a million passenger voyages. And this had a huge effect on the railway, and they were trying to appeal to uh, people as good guys mm -hmm. when they had this major labor problem, right? And one of the ways they did that was to sponsor music in the form of African Showboat, which mm -hmm. was a radio program. Yeah. It's also important to say that until that time, radio was in English, Hindi, Arabic, and then vernacular, like Swahili at the coast only, and then mm -hmm. vernacular languages. So that's an interesting, odd thing that came up at that time. Um, Professor Larry, what, what was the sound of independence during the same period where we had all these other musicians coming in and out of the, 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 the country in the region? Well, um, there's a group which comes to my mind. It was called OS Jazz, mm -hmm. which was a part of African Jazz of mm -hmm. Kalejev, led by Pascal Onema. Tom Boyer brought them to Nairobi. And mm -hmm. they, played, they played beautiful songs for Kanu, praising Kanu, praising Kenyatta and Boyer, and of course Odinga a little, mm -hmm. because they, didn't, they were not getting along with, with Boyer. So that, that was it. And then we, we had songs played and recorded for Uhuru, mm -hmm. huh? about mm -hmm. Harambe and so on. There were other songs played at campaign rallies by other musicians, which would not see the light of day. Because, huh? you know, before independence, the people who controlled the space for recording and the mm -hmm. space for, and the organization, and, the, and, 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 and our white friends who, who are leading the musicians, huh? were from a, from a, a specific, space. yeah, a security mm -hmm. background within the British system. One of the odd sounds that is not actually of how you asked mm -hmm. was the song Harambe Harambe. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And it's odd because it wasn't uh, grassroots in the way we think of it mm -hmm. today. It's so much played still so many years later, right? But it really was an effort to remain relevant by music producers mm -hmm. um, who saw the world is changing, colonialism is over, we need to repackage our mind towards a new audience. Mm -hmm. So it's funny because it becomes a song that is so ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. After yeah. all these years, it used to play on the, before the news, before it's, everything, yeah. you know, all that. But nevertheless, it was an effort to not lose a market, mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. going forward. So that's an interesting, odd thing that came up at that time. Me, my take on that, just one word, mm -hmm. is the African twist. Okay. I was about mm -hmm. 10 years old when we were getting uh, our independence. And it all rang in my head was the African twist. It was twist and twist again and come on twist. So that's, the, to me, the sound for independence. It's interesting the impact that these two Congolese musicians had on the, on the, on the Kenyan music scene because we, we can still experience the Congo connection even now. We have many, many, many uh, Congolese bands playing around the city, Kisumu, Nairobi, and we also have you know, huge, uh, popular, famous Congolese musicians that are loved here uh, uh, in the country. So, um, Tabu, what other impact did the Congolese musicians um, leave in the country? What did we take from the Congolese? We took everything. But one thing that I want you to also to know, that we also gave them something back. Besides. Okay. You see, like, uh, in, the, in, the, in the late 50s, or around mid-50s, we had a group that came from World War II, the same form after World War II, by Charles War, you know, by Peter Colmo, mm -hmm. called the Jumbo Boys. Mm -hmm. The Jumbo Boys actually had a female singer called Esther John. Mm -hmm. And Esther Jones was the sister to uh, Fadili. Fadili William. And Esther John was married to some uh, young man then known as Ben Nicholas, mm -hmm. or Ben, he was a saxophonist. Mm -hmm. And then they, when Jumbo Boys uh, broke up, Ben Nicholas with, I think, uh, Joseph Chusa, mm -hmm. I think it was a Ugandan, half Ugandan, half Congolese, they, they moved to Congo. Mm -hmm. They went to Kinshasa. And the band was now called City Five. They are the people actually who now started doing proper jazz. I mean, in, in, in Kinshasa, they used to play in a, uh, in a club, I think it was called Afro Mugambo. So mm. we, we, we gave them something too. So we didn't just take from Congolese, we took from uh, their finger picking guitar style and uh, all the Kiswahilis, mm -hmm. that's why we had the Esai Muinamo, the Kabakas and the rest. But we also gave them a bit of our jazz in return. 
thank you so much again it's been a great honor thank you for sharing your stories and experiences and of, of course your intellectual work as well to play us out we're going to listen to the Nairobi City Ensemble they will perform the song Masanga by Jean Bosco Mwenda I've been your host Lucy Ilado journey through Shades of Benga continues. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platforms for the next episodes. Shades of Benga, the book, is available in all leading bookstores in Kenya. Get your copy for this and other stories in full. Mambo Vipi, Mambo Vipi.